So what are you spending time working on that? stand up and say it's not an exciting time, it's time for me to get a different job and uh, someone else to do it. So, uh, But uh, the importance of matter at high energy densities is, is really, uh, it's been, ex I'd say, exploding over the last two decades as we've developed, developed these tools that can create matter at high energy densities and we can study it and we see lots of different applications for it uh, in our understanding of the universe. Also, uh, here on Earth, we want to uh, understand it for various reasons, I'll talk about that. Um, and, uh, and so that's in a really exciting time. We have new tools, new diagnostics, new capabilities to reach new conditions. Uh, there's a lot of interest and uh, um, a, a lot of capability uh, and a lot of groundbreaking science going on. We use uh, NIP, which is the world's most energetic laser by quite a bit, uh, and I'll talk some more about that, uh, to do about two experiments per day. Uh, I'll show you why it's challenging to do a lot more than that. Um, and we're addressing some fundamental questions in the behavior of matter at high energy densities. And one of the big grand challenges, a grand scientific challenge for our field is to try and do uh, achieve fusion and ignition in the laboratory. Um, that's uh, the situation where we uh, get a lot more energy out than we invest it into our fusion fuel, um, create a, a, a fusion, uh, propagating fusion burn wave, um, and uh, if we could do that, uh, we would create even higher energy density. The burning fusion plasma would create very extreme conditions. Um, it may someday pave the way to a, a, an alternative energy source. Uh, um, uh, there are a lot of challenges for that. I'd say that's a many decadal uh, kind of problem, um, but uh, it is an exciting problem and uh, something that uh, I think we're going to make a lot of progress on over the next few years. All right. So just kind of a, a little bit of background. When we talk about high energy density matter, we're just talking exactly what it sounds like. We're putting a lot of energy in a very small volume to create high energy densities. And an energy per unit volume is a pressure. 
So you can uh, think of it in, in, in joules per cubic meter, or you can think of it in terms of uh, units of atmospheric pressure. Uh, and we define high energy density matter as when we have matter that's at a million times atmospheric pressure. Um, uh, and so everything above that is, is you know, kind of what we're interested in this field. Uh, and, you know, just to put some, you know, the, obviously the, the atmospheric pressure around us is, a, is 10 to the minus 6 in these units of millions of uh, 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 times atmospheric pressure, or megabars. Um, I'll use those interchangeably. Uh, you can also use um, 100 gigapascals, so there's a lot of different units that different people use, but uh, I tend to use um, megabars. Um, high explosives uh, going off generates about 100 kilobars of pressure, uh, so um, so that's relatively low on the scale pressures that we are interested in. Um, if you take the energy in a hydrogen atom and you look at how much energy it, it, that electron is bound by 13.6 eV of energy, and you look at the volume of the hydrogen atom, that's about a million times atmospheric pressure that and that energy density. So when you start squeezing on matter with those kinds of pressures, you actually change the behavior of the electronic orbitals and you start to change the chemistry that's going on at those conditions. You change, um, you know, so all the things we're used to at everyday uh, room temperature and pressure uh, get very different when you uh, start squeezing on matter with pressures that are comparable to the, the binding energy of the electrons. And then as you go to more extreme conditions, the center of the Earth is about 3.5 million times atmospheric pressure and the center of Jupiter is greater than 30 million times atmospheric pressure, and then all the way to the center of the sun, where it's very, very hot and very, very dense, uh, is over 250 billion times atmospheric pressure. And we can reach kind of conditions across that entire range on the national emissions. So this is just a, um, a, a plot of what we call the phase space for matter at high energy densities, showing temperature in uh, units we don't normally use, uh, well, a logarithmic plot of the temperature in Kelvin, and the density in grams per cc. And so most of the stuff we're familiar with are, are right down here at, you know, border one gram per cc, that's water, and, you know, a few hundred degrees Kelvin, right? Uh, but most of the universe is at very different conditions than that. So as you go, for instance, most of the matter on Earth is actually uh, of course, in the, as you go into the core of the Earth and the pressure goes up um, to that three and a half billion times atmospheric pressure, Jupiter has you know much even higher pressures. Of course, the Sun, much higher temperatures, millions of degrees and, and, and uh, thousands of grams per cc. Um, in inertia profound infusion, we're trying to reach up here at tens of millions of degrees and uh, thousands of grams per cc. So, um, so you know, very very extreme, very far from what we're commonly used to. And matter just behaves very differently in, under those conditions. And as we try to understand the universe, the planets, stars, um, jets, uh, um, as we try to understand uh, the uh, um, matter in these inertial kind of fusion experiments, we have to understand many different properties of, of material in those conditions, uh, and uh, um, not just um, you know. How, how dense it is or how hot it is, but the equation of state, how does it behave when we squeeze it, what's the atomic structure, how strong is it, many different properties that need to be understood at all, at all these different conditions of temperature and density, and that means uh, there's a lot of science to do. Um, and we now have a new, new tools for actually generating matter at these conditions, and so it's really, uh, for the first time in history, we can produce matter at a large fraction of this parameter space, and then we can measure its properties uh, scientists around the world are interested in that for the various science they're, they're, they do. Uh, so some examples, right? Again, I mentioned the center of the Earth. So if you want to understand where the Earth, uh, the Earth has a solid core with a liquid mantle, um, if you want to understand that boundary, where is it solid, where is it liquid, um, and, and that's really important because having a liquid mantle means we have a, uh, a dynamo that generates a magnetic field. That magnetic field protects us from the solar wind. Obviously, uh, if we didn't have uh, that solar wind, uh, if we didn't have that protection from the solar wind, it turns out, if you look at Mars, which doesn't have a magnetic field, it would strip off the atmosphere and there wouldn't be life on, on Earth. So understanding the properties of iron at these extreme conditions uh, actually tells you something about, about life on Earth, but also uh, about on exoplanets. So there's now thousands of 
uh, exoplanets that have been discovered that have very different properties than the planets in our solar system. And so by understanding the property of materials, we can understand maybe which of these are candidates for life, uh, which is something that's very interesting uh, to the astrophysics community. Um, you know, we want to understand planets like Jupiter. We have a probe now called Juno that's uh, flying around Jupiter, trying to understand its magnetic field, and also uh, uh, the structure of Jupiter. And so there's a lot of questions about materials at high pressure that are uh, of interest to those scientists who, are, who built the Juno probe. Uh, there's just fundamental questions. What happens when you take a material and you squeeze it? How does it behave? It turns out that for some materials, you can get superconductivity super at, at room temperature if you squeeze it to high enough pressures. You know, are there materials out there that we can squeeze uh, um, and maybe even they're metastable? Uh, they will be. They will be even as you take the pressure off. They'll stay in those extreme conditions. Uh, that that orientation. One example of that is is diamond. So. Diamond is a phase of carbon. Uh, graphite is the normal phase of carbon, like just in your, your, your pencil leads, right? Uh, and if you squeeze it up and hold it at high pressure for long enough, it will form diamond. And then you let the pressure off and it, and it stays in the diamond state. There are, uh, are other materials like that and we're exploring for even more extreme condition, more extreme materials like that. And then inertial confinement fusion, the work we do uh, there depends on our understanding of material properties at very extreme conditions. Uh, so we have these new tools that have been developed. Um, they've been developed in support of the National Nuclear Security Administration. Uh, we have now gone 26 years without doing an, uh, an underground nuclear weapons test in the US. Uh, we want to maintain our nuclear weapons. We want to make sure they're safe, secure, effective. Uh, we want all our adversaries to know that they would work if we ever needed to use them, uh, so we never ever have to use them, right? Uh, we want our allies to know that as well. And so uh, the NNSA uh, has made a big investment in, in understanding the science of nuclear weapons so that we can maintain our confidence in these weapons without testing them. And so, so that led to the construction of an upgrade of a facility at the University of Rochester called the Omega Facility. The Z Pulse Power Facility, which Carl mentioned uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, at Sandia, and, and the NIF. Uh, um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go, since I work at NIF now, I'm going to tell you a lot more about NIF uh, in the next few years. First, I want to tell you a little bit about our lab. If you haven't been out there, we're, I'm from about 45 miles, uh, 45 minutes drive, depending on traffic. It won't be that when I go home tonight. Uh, but it was that when I was coming here today, So because uh, uh, I came in the afternoon. Um, so it's a one square mile site uh, on the edge of Livermore. Of course, you know, this was taken uh, in, the, in the green part of the year. It doesn't look like that now. Um, uh, and, uh, and this is the National Mission Facility. So it's a big chunk of that one square mile. So this is what it looks like uh, from the top. It's the world's most energetic laser. It has uh, um, uh, 192 separate laser beams. If we actually Look, you could put three football fields on the on the roof of NIF. Um, we don't play football up there, obviously, um, but uh, but, you, but you could. You'd have enough space. And uh, if you take the, the roof off, what you see on the inside is 192 separate laser beams. Each of them can deliver about 10 kilojoules of energy uh, at 351 nanometers. So that's kind of the ultraviolet, um, uh, near ultraviolet. Um, and they can concentrate the energy from these three football fields into a target that's uh, about a centimeter in, in scale. So, um, so that, that's how we get to high energy density. So we, um, and we deposit that energy in just a few billions of a second. Um, so uh, we can contain it in there for a little bit of time, um, create matter in these extreme conditions at very high pressures and temperatures and densities, and then probe it, try and understand what's going on, uh, make a measurement, compare it to our calculations, and see if we're, we understand what's going on in, in these extreme conditions. So just a little bit more. This is one of the two laser bays that holds 96 laser beams. We're looking down on top of them. You can see uh, uh, some people here to give you a sense of the scale. Uh, so again, big, big. This is a uh, uh, where all those beams converge into the target chamber which is about 10 meters across. Uh, it's evacuated so that the lasers can propagate to this little target, but also so that when uh, 
they deposit all their energy. There isn't a lot of atmosphere around to couple uh, to and create a, a giant blast wave so that you know the thing survives after for multiple shots. Um, the target, of course, gets destroyed. Every every experiment the target gets destroyed. We have to build a new one. This is a Photoshop image. There's actually a floor here uh, that they photoshopped out, but you can see the beams coming in from the top and the bottom, and uh, a person down there. And this is the center uh, inside the target chamber. You can see there's a little tiny target there. Again, about the tip of your uh, pinky. Um, it, uh, it has some diagnostics that are aligned close to it so they can see what's gonna, going on in the experiment. Um, and it's held on this very big uh, target positioner. We have to hold the target very, very stably so that it doesn't wobble. Uh, um, it has to be held to about 25 microns of tolerance. Um, and you're holding it, you know, 15 feet. So if you had a long, skinny thing, it would uh, it would wobble a lot. But because it's a, a big, massive boom, it holds it very stably, so that the lasers hit it exactly where we want them to hit it. And so, you know, uh, NIF is really um, uh, we like you know focus on the science that we do at the business end. What what's the science when the lasers are firing and, and creating the very extreme conditions? Um, but there's a lot of engineering and science that goes into doing any one NIF experiment. Um, we have to have uh, world, you know, some amazing uh, optics, um, each of which is, is, is quite big. They're kind of 40 centimeters on the side. They have precision, they've been precision machined to kind of nanometers of surface roughness. Um, they're engineered to be very robust to the intense laser light that's propagating through them. Uh, even then they damage. We hold the targets in some experiments at cryogenic conditions, so we have to hold them to kind of millikelvin tolerances, about 20 degrees above absolute zero. We have to uh, diagnose what's going on, so we have you know X-ray cameras, neutron cameras, uh, looking at particles, looking at the time history of the emission of, of everything that comes out of the experiment to study what's going on. We have to be able to build these targets um, uh, to very, very tight tolerances, uh, and, um, uh, and then we have to do it in a production type way so because they get blown up every time. And then we have um, a very sophisticated control system um, that actually controls all the different elements, all 192 beams, 60,000 different control points. It's got 5 million lines of computer code. So it's a very sophisticated, uh, and it is really the lifeblood of the system, right? If we had to do everything manually to get ready for one shot, it would take us, you know, months and months to prepare for one experiment, but we want to do an experiment every 12 hours or so. Just to give you an idea of the complexity of the targets, um, we have many different components that are uh, put together to um, uh, do one experiment. So, uh, and they're all driven by the specifications that are set from our computer simulations saying, okay, if we configure this in this way, we'll reach these pressures, we'll be able to study this effect that we're, we're interested in. But many different components, again, this is all very tiny, so you need you know, essentially uh, magnifying glasses to see all these things. And they have uh, incredibly tight tolerances, um, surfaces smooth to nanometers of roughness, um, uh, precision parts aligned to micron tolerances. All those things go into uh, uh, building one of these targets, and, then, and, uh, and they need to in order to do the, the science that we're interested in. This is what it actually looks like when we put it together. So the, um, in this experiment, which is one of our cryogenic ignition targets, we fill it with deuterium and tritium fusion fuel uh, in liquid form. We then cool it down to fr uh, temperatures where the deuterium and tritium freeze, turn into a solid. Um, it starts as a puddle on the bottom of a capsule. And then um, because the tritium beta decays, it releases heat, that heat um, there's more heat at the bottom where all the tritium and deuterium are, are puddled and uh, it causes the deuterium and tritium down there to sublimate and redistribute itself in an isotherm basically and gr it grows a sphere, uh, a thin spherical shell of deuterium and tritium uh, and that's the kind of, that's what we want to implode in, in our implosions. So uh, very sophisticated uh, control needed in the, in the cryogenics uh, to, to me the shape of that deuterium and tritium layer and make it perfectly spherical. Mark, yeah. that kind of implies that you have more difficulty with a non-tritiated target. 
Well, um, if you wanted to do an experiment with just deuterium, right, um, you need, a, uh, you, you can't do that uh, with this technique, right? So you need a different way of making a deuterium shell than a deuterium tritium shell. Um, one way you could do it is you could put a foam in there, like a sponge, a uh, thin sp uh, um, that perturbs the implosion, so there's a problem with that, but we've done experiments with deuter deuterium, um, thin deuterium shells that have uh, wicked foams. Uh, you could also use infrared layering. You could use infrared heat to actually accomplish the same effect as the, the, tra the training data you can. Well, as I understood it, the DT shots are like the minority. Okay. We do one of these layered shots almost every week right now. So, uh, but we do 400 shots a year. So that you're right. We only do um, we do far fewer shots with deuterium and tritium than than all the shots we do. Um, that's, that's exactly right. There's a lot of things we need to understand in order to get ready for one of those deuterium and tritium experiments. There are kind of most expensive experiments require the most precision in control. Uh, it's not just about blowing things up. We want to measure what happens, right, and compare that to our simulations. And so we have over 80 diagnostics. Uh, actually, several folks from the nuclear engineering department work with us, uh, are, are working, uh, graduates from the nuclear engineering department are working with us on, on diagnostics now. Um, we have um, this one we call Dante, uh, affectionately, because it's looking into hell. That little can is a few million degrees. Right, so if you vision what what's your vision of hell, right? Uh, you know it's very hot. Um, so this little whole realm is very very hot, um, and this records the time history of the um, X-rays that are emitted from that little whole realm. Uh, this diagnostic, um, when a deuterium and tritium fuses, uh, every once in a while, about ten to the uh, minus five times for every deuterium tritium fusion, a gamma ray is emitted, a 15 MeV gamma ray. And those travel at the speed of light. So if we can measure the time history of the 15 MeV gamma rays from this little uh, burning fusion plasma, we can say what the time history of the fusion plasma was, how, how it was burning. And so that's what this diagnostic is here, called the gamma reaction history diagnostic. Um, and we have many others. Uh, the magnetic recoil spectrometer looks at um, the, the temperature of the neutrons, the, distribution of energy of neutrons that is produced in the fusion plasma, and we can relate that to uh, the temperature of the fusion plasma itself. And that was developed in collaboration with MIT. Uh, so uh, Ed mentioned that we do um, you know, only a small fraction of our experiments are deuterium and tritium experiments. Uh, so we do a lot of different kinds of experiments. One of the things we do is we allocate some of the time to uh, researchers at different institutions. So there's a competitive call for proposals every year, and, and, and scientists who are interested in using NIF to do you know, fundamental science, understand material properties, or to study um, nuclear physics that's of interest to um, the, the Big Bang, uh, nucleosynthesis, look at some reactions like TT fusion or helium 3 helium 3 fusion, something that doesn't happen very uh, easily, uh, even in, in accelerators. Um, well, we can study that uh, on NIF. We can create very, very high velocity, very hot plasmas that are of very low density to study uh, something called a collisionless shock, which is something that is seen in astrophysics. When a supernova goes off, it launches a shock wave out, and that shock wave goes out. And if you actually look at the scale of the shock wave, it, it's very sharp. So, um, but if you actually look at the mean free path of particles, um, we think, typically think of a shock wave as having, um, a, being a very collisional object, something where uh, there are many, many um, uh, mean free paths across uh, the, the shock wave. Um, but in this case, um, the particles have mean free paths that are much longer than this, than this, than this front, this shock front would suggest. And so the, the shock is mitigated not through collisions, particle collisions, but electromagnetically. That's what creates these very sharp features, and it's something very interesting to plasma astrophysicists. So we get all different types of uh, proposals that come in. Um, an example of one of those was to study carbon uh, at extreme pressures. Uh, so this is some work that was featured on the cover of Nature a, a, a few years back where we drive the lasers in and create this radiation, very intense 
um, radiation environment. That radiation environment generates a pressure wave that propagates through a sample. The sample is made out of uh, carbon um, with a little thin gold layer in there. Um, the, the pressure wave traveling in the carbon um, starts this uh, moving in this direction and we can measure with a, um, a, a sophisticated optical system the velocity of that pressure wave as it propagates through the diamond at various, and, and because we have different step heights, we can look at the different times of arrivals of those pressure waves at the edge of this um, sample. And from looking at that, we can tell in detail how that pressure wave propagated through the diamond, and we can use that to say how compressible is diamond. When you press on it with you know, 50 megabars of pressure, what density does it go up to? And that's very important for understanding things like uh, the core of Jupiter, uh, the core of Neptune. Uh, or other exoplanets that are uh, uh, now being discovered. Uh, there's a lot of this kind of work going on, and uh, it, it, it's uh, it's pretty neat because it uh, for us it's not what we do tend to do in our day job. So it's an opportunity to work with the outside world and the community, um, and it also gets a lot of interest in the scientific literature. So here's an example. You can see someone took uh, the idea of a Death Star, right, and shining at the center of the Earth, right? And this is work we did on the behavior of iron at very high pressures. Uh, recently, in August, an article was published in Science Magazine to look at um, how hydrogen, if you squeeze it enough, turns into a metal. Um, and, uh, and that got picked up not only in Science Magazine, but also uh, in, in, in the New York Times. So uh, the, um, it, you know, it's kind of neat to see the stuff you do um, uh, in the New York Times. All right, so that's kind of the fundamental science stuff we're doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot more I could go into there, but I wanted to get to, you know, the thing that really is an organizing team for NIF. NIF stands for National Ignition Facility. Uh, ignition, I'd say, right, is our middle name. We're trying to achieve fusion ignition in the laboratory. We don't want to just study nature. Right? We want to actually control nature. Uh, we want to, um, you know, bend it to our will. Right? Uh, we want to be able to do the things uh, to it and, and make it, and you know, uh, change it. Uh, we want to be able to control it in a way that we can do things like get more energy out than we put in in a fusion reaction. So you all know this very well, right? The, the, the fusion reaction with the highest cross section at the temperatures we can easily reach, not easily, but uh, can reach. In the laboratory is the deuterium and tritium uh, uh, cross section. So we fuse a deuter deuterium and a tr triton. We get a neutron that escapes with a lot of energy and a helium, uh, or an alpha particle that, uh, because it's charged, will tend to slow down pretty rapidly and deposit its energy locally. And so the question in inertial climate fusion is: Can we assemble a mass of deuterium and tritium to high enough densities and temperatures? that um, significant fusion reactions take place. When the significant fusion reactions take place, the heliums will deposit more energy and will heat it up. Um, and if we have enough of an assembled mass, can we actually get a, a, a runaway reaction, a, a propagating burn? Can we actually uh, get this self-heating to cause the reaction to run away um, and, and get hotter and then cause more fusions, which get even hotter and basically burn up all, you know, a significant fraction of the fusion fuel uh, uh, that we've assembled. And if we did that, we think we could get more fusion yield out than the energy we invested into that, that plasma uh, or even into that little hole rum in, in laser energy. And we, essentially, we could have a, a release of energy. Um, obviously, um, uh, if you could do that, it would create a very interesting state of matter, very, very high temperatures, very extreme pressures, which we're very interested in for our National Nuclear Security Administration uh, role. But it also could be, again, a, a path in the future to, to an, an energy device. Of course, there's other ways of doing uh, fusion, uh, but there's gravitational confinement, like the sun does, and magnetic confinement fusion. Um, which is the basis of uh, a lot of research uh, around the world um, where you use a magnet, um, that strong magnetic fields to hold very high temperature plasma but very, very low density, very low pressure relative to the plasmas we're creating on NIF. So just a little more mathematically, how does this work? Suppose you have a blob of deuterium and tritium that has a density of uh, uh, a radius 
and a temperature. So, and so just a spherical blob like that. And you say, how long will this blob sit around for before it falls apart? That time scale is the assembly time. It depends on the radius and the sound speed, which scales like the radius over the square root of the temperature, since that's how the sound speed varies with the square root of the temperature. And you can also ask, how long will it take for the fusion reaction uh, to, to burn a given piece of, of plasma? And that depends on only two things, the density of the plasma and the reactivity of the plasma. And this reactivity is only a function of the temperature. So, so we have two quantities, a burn time and a disassembly time. And if we have a disassembly time that's comparable to the burn time, or even long compared to the burn time, we will um, burn up a lot of the fusion fuel. This is really hard to do to get enough. Um, what that says is if we, we want the disassembly time to be comparable to the burn time, we need uh, a large rho r, and this depends only on temperature, so we also need a large temperature. And uh, if you have, just for round numbers, we need a rho r of order 0.4 grams per centimeter squared and a temperature of 5 keV for this fractional burn up to be uh, you know, interesting, a few percent. So that would mean we would burn up something like a few percent of the fusion fuel that we, uh, we imploded. From this simple, these two simple numbers, we can actually see how challenging it is going to be to, to do inertial time fusion in the laboratory. We know we need a rho r and a temperature. I just went through that. Then we can say how much energy we, do we need. Uh, the energy depends just on the mass times the temperature. You can write that out. Um, and it only depends on quantities which we know, the rho r, which I've already said, and the temperature, both cubed, divided by the pressure squared. And if we know how much energy we have, which we do on if we have about 2 megajoules of energy, but only about 15 kilojoules gets into this little blob here. I'll talk a little bit about that. That means we need a pressure of about 400 billion times atmospheric pressure, which is very, very extreme pressure, greater than the pressure of the center of the sun. And if it's 30 microns in radius, which is kind of a typical number, that means the density of this fusion fuel is about 100 grams per cc, right? So water is 1 gram per cc, so it's very, very compressed matter. And it will only last there for about 30 trillions of a second. So uh, uh, a very uh, extreme condition. And I'll talk a little bit about how we can get there. Um, I just put this in contrast to magnetic fusion, which is the, the approach that is um, uh, more studied as a path to energy. Uh, there they have a typical confinement time of not picoseconds, but seconds. They have pressures that are not hundreds of gigabars, but bars. Uh, and densities in the order of 10 to the minus 10 grams per cc. So that'd be a very good vacuum in most, for most systems. So, so the question is, how do we create these very, very high pressures? We um, have, um, uh, we can generate with the radiation, that environment that we create in our fusion system, in our little whole ROM, our, our little piece of hell, um, a, a pressure of about 100 million times atmospheric pressure, 100 megabars. Um, and we can use that pressure, um, but you know, we need to get to these fusion conditions, we need 4,000 4, times higher pressures uh, if we're going to reach these conditions I just talked about. So we need to concentrate that pressure into a smaller volume, and that's the way we do that is with an implosion. So what we're trying to do is use the pressure we can generate to drive this shell in at very high velocities. And when that shell runs out of space at the center of this uh, volume uh, and stuff runs into stuff on the other side, you rapidly change that kinetic energy into internal energy. And that internal energy uh, uh, is, creates very large pressures. And those very large pressures are what we use uh, to, do, to reach these few conditions. So this is a little schematic, a little uh, snapshot of a simulation that shows what this looks like uh, in the laboratory. So we have a uh, laser beams coming in. So this is the configuration at time t equals zero. There's that little capsule there with a deuterium tritium layer on the inside. The inside is made out of plastic. The lasers are coming in and they're heating up this gold wall uh, little cylinder we call a whole rum. As it heats up. It sends shock waves into this uh, capsule, causing it to implode. The outside of the capsule blows off 
Um, uh, that's what generates the momentum that causes this to implode. And eventually, it stagnates at these very extreme conditions, at least in the simulations, right? So. In doing this, we're really giving up a lot of energy in order to get energy density. So just to walk you through that, to do our experiments, we pour, pull about 400 megajoules off the grid. Um, the 400 megajoules then uh, uh, discharges into a flash lamp. Uh, flash lamps pump the, the gain media of the laser. So we then extract that energy in the laser, so we have about 10 megajoules in the amplifier, uh, in the amplifier slabs. That uh, goes into about uh, two megajoules that we uh, shine down into this little target. Of that two megajoules, about 150 kilojoules is absorbed by that little capsule. And of that 150 kilojoules, only 15 kilojoules ends up into the fusion fuel. So we're losing energy, but we're getting energy density, getting pressure uh, in return. This is what a, a capsule implosion looks like. Uh, now we're blowing up on the capsule itself. You can see the capsule is a very thin shell, and very thin shells, when you're pushing on them, are subject to instabilities, and in particular the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, which is a uh, uh, an instability that affects nearly all fusion systems in one way or another. In this case, it's it's causing this little shell, floating shell, to be ripped apart. Um, if we can make the, the capsule smoother and smoother, then we we um, the seeds for this come from the roughness of the capsule. If we make the capsule smoother, we anticipate that uh, the shell will be more smooth as it as it explodes. So we put a lot of effort in making smoother and smoother shells uh, so that we get. Um, relatively stable implosions. So this is what it looks like in more detail. We have lots of different parameters we can vary. We have the, the shape of this whole round. Uh, uh, we use right circular cylinders usually, but we can vary that. Um, we have what this capsule is made out of. We make capsules out of plastic, beryllium, and diamond. We have how thick the shell is, how big the capsule is. We have to control how we hold that capsule in place, which is um, uh, which we're sensitive to, and we have to fill it with a little tiny fill tube. Uh, in this case, our typical fill tube is about 10 microns in diameter, and the capsule diameter is about two millimeters, so it's a very, very tiny straw that we're, we're filling this deuterium and tritium liquid fuel into the capsule with. Uh, so this is one of those shells, uh, very uniform. Um, this is what it looks like when you actually radiograph it. Uh, and it's got the deuterium and tritium layer there. So that's the deuterium and tritium layer. This is the plastic shell, which has different levels of opacity depending on how we dope uh, that plastic shell. Um, you can see it's, it's quite round. And then when we implode it, um, it gets down to about 35 times smaller. So we're, we're trying to compress it spherically by about a factor of 35. If you think about it, it's like squeezing uh, a basketball down to something the size of a pea. So if you squeeze too hard on one side or the other side, right, if you don't squeeze it very, very uniformly, you won't get a nice round P at stagnation. You'll get something that's a big extended blob. You won't have a, a perfectly spherical little shell. And so we spend a lot of time making sure that when we implode this capsule, we implode it very symmetrically um, by controlling how we point the lasers, how we turn the time history of the power of the lasers into that whole line. So just a quick a uh, snapshot of how we've uh, made progress over the, over the few years. So NIF turned on in 2009, uh, so we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary. We've done about 2,500 experiments on NIF to date, um, or doing a lot of different science, but again, a big fraction of them are looking at this problem of inertial time fusion. When we started, uh, we, and we didn't realize it at the time, we were holding these capsules with these think pieces of saran wrap. It was very, very special saran wrap. They hate it when I call it that, but that's, uh, you know, think of thin plastic membranes that are holding that capsule in place. What we didn't realize at the time, because our calculations didn't say that this would be a big effect and we weren't looking, was that those thin plastic membranes were actually ripping the capsule apart wherever they were touching the capsule. And so, um, so, and, and this is a radiograph of that capsule imploding, I think a dental x-ray image, and you can see the, that it's being ripped apart. And that meant we weren't getting um, very uniform compression, and the pressures we reached, the temperatures we reached were, were quite low, and the yields were quite low. We're trying, remember, we're trying to get two megajoules out, and we, we were only getting two kilojoules, so we're off by a factor of 1,000. Um, we made some 
Right, so this is actually just some 3D simulations showing what that looks like in 1D. You know, things look very good. If, if we could legislate the world was completely symmetric and there are no perturbations, it would look good. Even the perturbations that come from asymmetries don't look so bad, but when you throw in the, the perturbation from surface roughness and, the, and this tent scar, you can see that instead of a nice round shell that we're creating there, we're disrupting it and injecting a lot of uh, ablator material, and it's not a nice fusion plasma like we'd like to create. So it kind of looks pretty messy. So then we made some progress. We, um, we instead of trying to implode the capsule very, very slowly and carefully, we um, hit it harder at the beginning with a, with a shock. That shock meant that it's much less susceptible to these instabilities that come from uh, that tent. And so it's much more uniform. You can see here, it doesn't have these scars ripping the capsule apart. Um, we couldn't, it isn't as symmetric as we'd like it to be. We'd like it to be rounder. This one is a little squished. Um, call that a pancake, right? So because it's lots skinny like this. Uh, if we do it the other way, we call it a sausage. It depends on your uh, favorite food type, because you could call it a hamburger and a hot dog, but anyway, that's what that's what we talk about it. Um, and then the yield went up almost a factor of 15 uh, to 27 kilojoules. The pressures got much higher, 250 gigabars. And so by hitting it stronger with, with, a, with a strong shock, we were able to reduce the instabilities that were affecting our performance and, and the change is really quite minor if you look at the at the time history of the laser pulse you see we went from something that looked like this red curve here to this blue curve here and really the only difference um, is is this this little change in the strength of the very first shock we send into the uh, into the implosion system but it made a big difference in how the instabilities grew uh, and that's shown here um, we can actually do experiments where we put little ripples on the capsule and see how they grow as a function of time by radiographing them. So we machine ripples in, we drive them, we look at how, how big they are as a function of time uh, with x-ray cameras, and we use that uh, to compare to our simulations of how uh, instabilities grow depending on the wavelength of the perturbations. And we see that by doing, we went from something that was very unstable to something much more stable, and it performed much better. And then most recently, we've been able to control the symmetry of the implosions better. And it turns out that that 10 micron fill tube, which is really, really tiny, was too big. Uh, and we went from a 10 micron fill tube down to a 5 micron fill tube. The yield went up significantly uh, to uh, about a factor of 50% uh, um, or so. So um, those two things, changing the symmetry and reducing the size of the fill tube, allowed us to do more symmetric implosions and just last year, we got up to around 57 kilojoules, um, or 210 to the 16 ET neutrons, um, which was a, about a factor two of what we were able to do previously. So if you look at this kind of graphically uh, over the last several years, and now I'm looking at, I mentioned this earlier, you know, those, those quantities, the rho r and the temperature. Um, and I said that you need about 5 keV in rho r's, about 0.4 grams per centimeter squared to get to ignition. So on this plot, this is the ignition threshold. We started down here with very low energies into the hot spot and very, you know, temperatures that were far from what we needed, um, temperature rho r products that were far from where we needed. And we made this progress with the stronger shocks. Then we got rid of the fill tubes and we moved even closer. And so over the last several years, we, we've made steady progress towards this, um, towards this boundary. Now, when we turn it on, uh, there are some people who were very optimistic about the simulations and thought we would get ignition right away, right? That's what the simulation said. Of course, one of the things, one of our roles is to provide experimental data that compare, we compare to simulations. Because if you think about the stockpile stewardship program, we're trying to make sure our nuclear weapons are going to be robust and, and, and secure and work for sure, right? But we're only using simulations. So it's very important in, you know, you can, as you all I'm sure know, right? You can get a code to give you uh, garbage in, garbage out, and you get the wrong, you can get the wrong answer from a simulation. And unless you validate it or compare it to other um, experimental data, uh, you might just be fooling yourself. And so this is an important lesson. It's a lesson that's important for stewardship program. And so I think it is, it, it's actually there, um, uh, you know, I, I think, of course, folks were over optimistic at the beginning, uh, and, and, and that was not the, the best 
thing to, to have done at that point in time, but you know, since then we've actually turned and focused on the science and tried to make you know, consistent scientific progress on this challenging problem. And we're, we're making good progress on it. So where, where does that put us? Um, so there's another way of thinking about uh, progress in fusion called the Lawson Criterion. Uh, it is something that's universal. It's for both magnetic fusion devices and, and inertial confinement fusion. Ignition, it uh, looks at the pressure and the, and the time that you can hold that pressure for, the confinement time, and compares that to a pressure and a time that you need for, for ignition. Um, this has been um, published in, you know, looking at it this way is a relatively uh, a few years ago publication. And, and what, it, what we find is that um, as we increase the loss in criterion, as we get closer and closer to a loss in criterion one, which is where the codes say that's where ignition should be, um, we're getting higher and higher yields and higher and higher performance. And we're, uh, so now just this, in 2017, we had a couple points here above, the, above this 10 to the 16 threshold. We now have something like 20 points up here. Um, we just did another shot on Sunday, which was, uh, was up here. And we're working on you know, closing the gap between where we are here and, and out here. And, and um, uh, there are many different things we're doing to improve the implosions to make them better. But we're very close to the place where we have a burning plasma where just as much energy um, is deposited in the, in the fusion plasma as was invested in the implosion. Uh, so that's an exciting new, new threshold that's around the corner. Eventually, we hope to then get to capsule gain, just as much energy out as we invested in that capsule. And then finally, to ignition, just as much energy out as we invested with the laser. Um, and so, uh, you know, just take me back to where we, where we started. Uh, I think it's a really exciting time. There's a lot of cool science going on. We're learning a lot about these systems. Um, we have, you know, biggest laser in the world by about a factor of 10 now. And, uh, and there's a lot, a lot more exciting science to do. Any questions? Ed? Yeah, um, this high foot campaign, well, you didn't talk about, yeah. but it's one of the bumps after right. the queen disappeared. Huh? The, the, one of the bumps halfway in the middle of that disappeared. You had a picture of the power pulse there. Oh, oh yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, so that means you had three shocks rather than four. Yeah. So the complaint about that is that then that's sort of a maybe limiting in the long run. Right. So that's a good point. Right. So right, that's right. That's so right. in order to um, get uh, as much, uh, so NIF was designed to use four shocks to uh, compress the fusion fuel up to get the maximum possible confinement uh, that, the, uh, that we can get with the amount of energy we have, right? To basically implode the capsule on very low adiabats, right? Uh, and in order to avoid this problem of uh, this shell being ripped apart, we gave up on you know, going to you know, things that would give 20 megajoules of yield in the calculation. Uh, to something that may only give a megajoule of yield in the calculation if the, everything was perfect, and instead uh, just try to make progress experimentally. And one of the ways we did that was increase the foot, which raises the adiabat, but also get rid of, the, of that uh, fourth shot. Okay, so your last next guys say you can make a megajoule with a three shot implosion? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, but it has to be a perfect implosion, and that's what we're, we're yeah. working on. Um, but the other thing is we're working on ways, for instance, of holding this capsule in here without using this tent, right? So um, we're actually right now working on uh, ways of holding it with, with strings that have much less surface con area contact. Um, you know, so basically yarn that's a couple microns across. And uh, we've demonstrated that, but we haven't fielded it yet. So, so basically looking for ways to get rid of the things that are causing the perturbation so that you could go back to the four-shot system. And it was Craig Sangster had a favorite spider in the base of his church. Right, that's right. Yeah, the spider silk. people use spider silk, yeah. But it turns out the spiders are not as reproducible as, uh, <laughs> as carbon yarn. So uh, we tried spiders, but it didn't work very well. Yeah? Uh, how many low-foot shots is this saturate? You mean this this stuff up here? Yeah. 
this is probably the difference between an actual measured pulse and the what, what they specified. So the laser um, has some amplitude modulation uh, that uh, just comes about by the by the very nature of the, of the laser, and so that's what that that is showing up there. So one is calculated, and one is actually measured. So. How was the the original wavelength with three three fifteen MB is arrived at? Um, so. Uh, we actually, there's a complicated trade-off of how, what are the ways you can, what, what lasers can you build that can deliver lots of energy, right? And so, uh, long ago, you know, it was clear that neodymium doped glass lasers were probably the most promising lasers for um, getting a very, very large energy. But one, so that's at 1053 nanometers, right? And uh, what happens when you shine that uh, light at very high intensities on a, on a solid is it rapidly turns to a plasma, which rapidly becomes a mirror and reflects most of the light back, right? Uh, and also generates very energetic electrons due to plasma instabilities. And so um, the coupling of the uh, light to the solid depends on the intensity of the light and the wavelength squared. So by going from 1053 nanometers down to 351 nanometers, you actually reduce the instability, the plasma instability, and you absorb much more of the light. Uh, so that's why we use 351 nanometers. The way we do it is we have uh, some nonlinear uh, uh, crystals that actually do frequency conversion. Basically, we take two one omega photons and create a two omega photon or five, uh, 526 nanometers, and then we add two one two omega photon and one omega photon in another nonlinear crystal and create. Um, a three mega folk on a three fifty one mega folk. Within, with it, I mean, that sounds incredibly complicated, but it happens with a very, very high efficiency. And the peak of the pulse is probably eighty percent efficient at converting red light into blue light. Uh, so that's good. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's not the case. Thank you very much.